as Luke mentioned, so many newer faces. We're so excited that you're here, and uh, if we can help you in any way, please let us know. Um, we're more than happy to do that. Um, just, um, you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the Gospel of John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We're concluding our More Fruit series. How many have enjoyed the series so far? Amen. Um, and uh, really, I debated for time's sake. I, I wanted to kind of read all the verses again and kind of recap all the different lessons we've learned, but I'm going to refrain from that, knowing my tendencies to go a little bit long, but I um, nonetheless hope that it's been a blessing to you, and um, I know it's been a challenge. You know, the Word of God should always uh, do two things. It should bless us, but should always challenge us. Uh, to grow, and I always, um, I use these two things a lot, comfort and challenge, you know, to be able to comfort us, to say, hey, I'm your father, I'm the one that gives fruit, I can give it to you, but also the challenge, right, the pruning and allowing God to be able to cultivate our hearts um, the way that he needs to in order uh, for us to be able to produce fruit. So today is the final message, the title is Fruit That Lasts, Fruit That Lasts, um, and this, this final message, I just want to talk real um, directly with you about how do we bear fruit that lasts? How do, we, how do we do that? How do we not only bear fruit? How many um, know that God wants you to bear fruit? But, but how do we bear fruit that lasts? How do we defy logic in a, in a lot of ways? And I, I really believe that there, there is something within all of us, because we're human, we want to do something that lasts. We want to make impact with our lives. We want to make a difference. We want to impact our world. We want to have something like a legacy, something that we're able to pass from our lives. And for a lot of us, I think the way that we go about trying to do that is we, we go about it the way the world says to do it, right? We, we chase success. Well, if I have the right career or I'm successful at my job, I have enough money, or my family looks a certain way. We try to, we try to build our lives, and we're chasing this idea of, I'm, I'm going to make an impact by what I can produce. The reality is, 100 years from now, it's all new people. I don't know if you recognize that or not, but um, 100 years from now, nobody will remember us. I don't care how many followers you have on TikTok, how many likes your videos get, no matter where you are and what you've done with your life, the fact is this morning is that a hundred years from now, they're not going to remember who you are. Give us some good news, Pastor. I just did because I want you to have the soberness of eternity today. And the reality of what God wants to do. None of all that we do in this life will last. If you're um, lucky enough to store away some money and be able to leave that for your children, right? They're going to spend it. I'm just waiting for, for uh, Mark and Jane. No, I'm just kidding. Right? No matter, no matter what we do in this world, it's not going to last. How many here actually know anything meaningful about your grandparents, great-grandparents? Great-grandparents. Okay, so six out of 230. All right. Right? You, you, most of us, if we know their name, we'd be lucky. And they could have been great people. They could have had great jobs, great careers. They could have been raised in church. They could do a lot of different things, but we're, we don't remember them. If we pursue success, like we, and, I, and I think I really want to land here because we need to rally around this together as a people, because it's hard in the culture that we live in today to come to terms with the fact that we're going to die and we're going to be forgotten. Because this is a world where we're so important, right? It's so important. Look at me. Can I get an amen? Look at me. Every time I walk by a child, look at, they're taking a picture of themselves. I don't know why. Who are you sending it to? 
this morning at the breakfast table. I won't mention who it was, but literally just taking a picture. Who in the world wants to see you at 8.30 with snots in your nose? But this is the world. So when I say that your life in 100 years, nobody's going to, that's shocking to some of you. Because we live in a world that's obsessed with us, what we can produce on our own. If we pursue success, listen to me here, and we're very successful at all the things that we want to do in this life, and I hope that that we are, right? We want to be successful. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you retire, in a matter of weeks, they forget you. It's just move on. It's just on to the next person, the next item. That's just the facts. There is a way, however, for us to have lasting impact to truly impact and have fruit that will echo into eternity, and that is through Jesus. And that's what our text is about today. The Gospel of John, two verses. If you would stand with me as we read the Word of God. We're going to read the last two verses of this section. Pray that God help us. We want to welcome those that are online. We do appreciate you for joining with us. John 15, beginning in verse 16. Jesus is concluding this section. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, to love each other. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the Father, I love that, then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. When you do what I've called and appointed you to do. This is my command. Here we go again, right? This last week, I love each other. Father God, we thank you for the wonderful presence of God that is here. We sense from the beginning chord of the first song that you are here, that you are working on our hearts. God, we we love you. We adore you today. I pray, God, most of all, that we would be able to see the life that we can live in you, that we can not only bear fruit, but God, all of us can have fruit that will last for eternity, God. I pray if there's any here that don't know you today, God, they would come to know you as Lord and Savior. God, we thank you, and we give you all the praise and all of God's people said, amen. You can be seated this morning. How do we bear fruit that lasts? That's the question today. I think it's really just kind of two parts. I'm I'm giving us three points in case you're um, that kind of learner. But I I think the three points are boiled down to this. What is the fruit that we should be looking for? And how do we get it? What is the fruit that Jesus is asking us to produce? And then how do we get it? Siri doesn't know the answer to that, by the way. (laughs) She's smart, but not that smart. So in our text, we have three truths that I believe will help you. How many want to bear fruit that will last? These are three truths that will help you and I to be able to do that. You ready? Point number one, good fruit is the only thing we produce that lasts. Let me say that again. Good fruit is the only thing that we produce that lasts. Jesus said that in our text. Look again at verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So if there's fruit that will last, there's fruit that doesn't last, right? He's making a distinction. When you you bear this kind of fruit in your life, this will be fruit that will last. And I feel like i got to point this out just in case you've missed it over the last five weeks. This is not... Jesus is not talking to us today about what we get at the produce section at the market. Okay, that's Desiree talk for the market. 
He's not, that's not the fruit that he's talking about. When we get fruit from the store and we bring it home, we might, if we're lucky, get a week out of it. Now, I, I got this wonderful bowl of fruit again today, and um, I'm, I'm not going to put it in front of me because I'll spit on it, and I can't share with my family. But one of the things that happens every week of the series is we, we make all this fruit. We encourage you today, if you didn't know, take a left, go into the cafe. There's a huge, gigantic bowl of fruit. Please come enjoy it. But they'll send me home with this in a Tupperware. And every week, I might have a little bit on Sunday night, and there's lots left. But what ends up happening, by Monday or Tuesday, I forget all about it. And by the time I go, and I go, oh my gosh, I've got this wonderful fruit. I go in there and pull it out. It doesn't look so nice any longer. No matter how great it was in the beginning, it only lasts for so long. Now, for all the freezer weirdos, I really put that in my sermon. Even if you freeze it, Right? If you're one of the freezer weirdos, I'm going to get to this. Some of you are the types that you like to use the fridge. I got to get this out of my, I just, it's therapy again. You like to use the fridge and the freezer for science projects. Do not look, if you are married to one of those, do not look at them. But someone on the stage right now is married to someone who likes to use, and I will say, I will come in after a month, I will pull this out. Is this a science project? What are we trying to make this into? Right? But even if you freeze fruit, I Googled it, you freeze fruit, you might, if you're lucky, get 8 to 12 months. Right? Some people say maybe two years, but ultimately it has an expiration date. It won't last forever. I'm convinced, by the way, that there are two types of people in this world. One that likes to use the fridge and freezer for science projects. And the other that if something is one day over expiration, wants to throw it out. And the two of you get married together. (laughs) That's how marriage is. One, I will not die, right? You, You literally think you will die if it's one day after the expiration. Look at Deb's going, that's right. Listen, if we, I wish we could do like a, a field trip as a church. Go to Pastor Mark and Des. Now, actually, you're all invited at some point. I mean, they're, they're great people. They'll invite you. If you go to their house, this is kind of rude to do, but just do it anyway. Go over to the fridge and open it up. And just stand there and look. There's like nine items. All of them are way ahead of expiration. Right? So that, that's, but Mark and Des are actually the same. Usually it's, there's a conflict there. Now, the bottom line is this. No matter how you cut it, at the end of the day, whether it's food or fruit, it doesn't last forever. And that's what makes what Jesus says, I believe, even more special today. That we can defy logic. We literally can defy nature by what he wants to do in our life. He says, I can produce fruit in your life that can last forever. I don't know about you, but I want that in my life. The fruit we bear for Jesus in him and through him will last for eternity, church. And it's so important that we understand that everything else we do in this life won't last. No matter how important you are, no matter how successful, no matter how many millions of followers you have, no matter, and a cup, you might get one generation away, they might remember you. That's best case scenario. But nobody eventually have a limited capacity to make impact. Everything we do in this life, write this down, won't last except what we produce for Jesus. Wow. What we produce for Jesus. So remember, the only fruit that will last is fruit that we bear for Jesus. The second thing that we learn out of our text is that God appointed you to produce good fruit. God appointed you to produce good fruit. That's what he says in our text in verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and what? And appointed you to go and bear fruit. 
through. That's the appointment God has for every believer. I chose you and appointed you. Jesus says God chose us to bear fruit. He picked you, church, to do something great for him. Don't get too excited. That will last for eternity. Nothing in this world can do that. I don't, I don't care how much money you store away, what kind of house you have, what kind of car you drive, whatever it is in this world, it eventually will expire. And Jesus says, there is something that I can do in your life that if you will allow me to produce it, you can bear fruit that will last for all of eternity. How many want that in their life? Jesus says, I chose you. You don't get to choose. He does. Well, I'm not sure if I would choose me. I get it. But it's not your choice. We don't get to choose. He does. And he didn't just pick me because I happen to be a preacher. He didn't pick Pastor Mark because of his teeth. I feel like he's almost Moses when he comes up here. He needs to put a veil in the Shekinah glory. Right? He didn't pick me. Well, yeah, pastors are supposed to bear fruit. Pastor Mark, yeah, he's a pastor. He's supposed to. No, we're all supposed to bear fruit that will last for eternity. And God says, I can do that if you will surrender your life to something bigger than just this world. You will pursue what I have for you that defies what this world says it's worth living for, to impact, think about this, to impact all of eternity. The Apostle Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26, one of my favorite verses. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many influential, not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. And listen, don't miss this verse, verse 29. So that no one may boast before him. God chooses people like us because when he chooses people like us, he gets all the glory. Because everybody knows what you can produce. They've seen you at your worst, and they say, how in the world? My mother-in-law often says to me, I don't know how you are such a good pastor, because I live with you. Right? That's Christ in us. All of us can bear good fruit. Because God chose us. You're not smart enough. You don't have enough talent. You're not, you don't have enough wisdom. You don't have enough strength. Only God in you can produce a life that you can't produce on your own. God, because he chose us. Let me ask you today, what did God choose you for? What kind of fruit is God asking you for? I was reminded today in prayer of one of the messages my brother-in-law Justin preached a few years ago. And he said one sentence that will stick with me forever. He said, God knows us better than anyone else, and he loves us more than anyone else. And I was in prayer, and I said, Justin, come over here. Remind me. He goes, oh, I can't remember. And I said, I know it's kind of like it. And then he came back. He goes, this is what it is. God knows you more than anybody else. And he loves you more. One thing to choose someone before you get to know them. A whole different thing to still choose them after you get to know them. That's what marriage is, by the way. <laughs> oh, I love you. I'm the death do us part. The sickness, sickness and in health. <laughs> And one month later, Pastor, can we talk to you? <laughs> it's anybody can say, I'll choose you when you don't live with them. It's a whole other thing when it's 
10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, and you're still choosing them. All of our relationships should look like that. And anyone can be friends when times are good. Anyone can love the new church. I, I, I get a kick out of people, Pastor, you know, we love it here, and they, they can come in a couple times, and this, this church is awesome, and I just love it, and, uh, and, I, and I just love everyone here, and, I, and, and okay, stick around. Because <laughs> eventually you'll find out, just like at your old church, they had people, they have people here too. Will you still choose to come? Will you still choose to serve and to love despite knowing everything about everybody? That's when a church becomes a church. God knows everything about you and he still wants you. Thank you, Lord. Whoever said that, thank you. Thank you, Lord. I don't even want myself most days. And God knows everything about Joe. Every frailty, every weakness, every struggle, every battle. And he says, I still want you. And I still want to use your life. And I've still appointed you to go and bear fruit. He knows our sin. He knows our doubts, our insecurities, the mistakes that we've made. Anybody here make mistakes in this life? You, you think you, you think that just I like two hands up. Someone just did this, two hands up. I can't even do that, I'll fall over. He knows all. Listen, I know like maybe 10% about you. And sometimes it's a struggle. God knows 100% about every thought, every deed, everything you've done since the day you were born. And he still says, I've chosen you. And I've appointed you to go. Some people here need to hear that word today. I've chosen you and I've appointed you to go and bear fruit. To let that settle in our hearts. Remember Moses, one of the first that God appointed. And and Moses said, I can't do that. I can't do what you're asking. You got the wrong guy. I, I, I stutter. I got all these issues. And I can't go and speak to Pharaoh. This guy has total control. He's holding back hostage the people of God and Moses is thinking I'm a murderer I mean we we forget that was Moses's past and God so I'm still choosing you think about that in Exodus 4 and verse 11 the Lord said to him who gave man his mouth Moses when he was trying to say I can't do it who gave man his mouth who makes him deaf or mute who gives him sight or makes him blind is it not I the Lord Now go. Stop giving me your excuses of why God can't use your life. Well, I've been a drug addict. I've I've wasted. I've made mistakes. And Moses has all the reasons why God can't use his life. And God said, I'm the one that made you, Moses. And I can help you. He says, now go. And I love this. I will help you. What a word today. When God calls all of us to extend and to go beyond where we think we can go for him. Remember this, that if we will go, God says, I will help you. If you will do what I'm asking you to do, if you will respond, stop sitting on the fence. I've got a life for you to bear fruit. He loves, God loves, he delights doing in us what we could never do on our own. God sees in us. Many times what we can't see. Many times what other people say, you'll never produce anything good. You'll, you'll, never, you'll never rise above the word from your your dad, your mom, or church leader, whatever it is, someone in your life who has spoken over you, you will never listen to me. God sees what sometimes we can't even see. And he says, I've chosen you. Pointed you to go. Bear fruit. Can somebody help me after church too and figure out how to get this iPad to stay open so I don't have to keep... Just 
a side thing. You figure after doing it this long, I would I'd figure at least ask for some help. But I've just noticed about 10 times I've got to push 4.7 to get into it again. In case you're wondering what my code is, you can get into my phone. It doesn't, it's, it's all sevens. I figure it's a godly number, so. There was a car that went up for auction a few years ago, and it sold for $2.4 million. Even though when it first went on sale in 1964, it sold for just over $12,000. Why would someone spend so much money on a car, right? Because it was actually an Aston Martin driven by Sean Connery in a couple of the James Bond movies. It's valuable because of who used it. Now, if this was a spirit-filled church like it's supposed to, you would have already gotten up out of your chair and ran around this building. It is valuable because who used it, our value comes when we submit to God and say, God, use my life. We can have fruit that will last for all of eternity. Our value comes because of who is driving our lives. Will you let him drive? Some of you, you want fruit. You want to bear fruit, but you're still driving the car. The value came when Sean got in it. The value comes in my life when God takes my life. I get out of the way and allow God. I surrender to his will, to his pleasure, to what he's called. This is where value comes from. Every young person here, your value doesn't come from TikTok or social status or WhatsApp or Facebook or book, whatever you have on your phone. Your value comes because of who your creator is, because God has chosen you and appointed you. That's where our value comes. It doesn't come because of followers we have. Who said? church that we could see the Father in heaven and his value for us. What his plan is for our lives that we can all bear fruit that will last. Ephesians 2 verse 10, the New Living Translation says it this way. For we are God's masterpiece. Wow. For we are God's masterpiece. He is created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do good things he planned for us long ago. This is bigger than I just wake up and go, I'll just do this with my life. No, God, long ago. And some of you need to hear that today. You need to hear God, your Father, say, you are my masterpiece, and I, a long time ago, have called and appointed you. I have plans for your life. Uh, you can produce fruit that will last. And the final part, then, is how. How do we actually make this kind of impact that will go on and last for eternity? Here's the third thing. But our text clearly shows us, and that is, to produce good fruit, we must go in love. We must go in love. It says it in verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And then he concludes this entire Incredible section of God's word about fruitfulness. He says in verse 17, this is my command, love each other. Doubles back. He doubles back again. He says, this is what it's all. I've chosen you. I want you to go. And this is not go once. Right? I, I, I went. I was a missionary. I was a pastor. I, I used to serve. No, this is ongoing. All of us to be an ongoing in the present that we will go. Whatever 
God is asking you to do and go, just do it. I don't care how small, maybe it's answer the altar call today. Maybe it's sign up to serve. Maybe it's take someone for coffee, start a Bible study, maybe be a missionary. I mean, I don't know what God's saying, but whatever it is, go. Stop putting it off. Going doesn't always mean go and be a missionary. It can mean go across the street. It can mean go to the coffee shop and produce good fruit. It can mean go to work and produce good fruit there. It can mean go to your local church and serve and produce good fruit. It can mean go home. It means go home and produce good fruit there. What's the point in producing fruit everywhere else except for where we live? Not a weird thing? Here's one for you. You can go online and produce good fruit. Someone needs to hear that today. I'm so glad I'm off Facebook. It helps me to still love you. Did you know you can go online and produce good fruit? I'll just let that settle in. Just kind of. <laughs> Everywhere we go, we can produce good fruit because of the one producing it in us. Jesus says, All of your going, this is the crux, must be done. With love. No matter, no matter what else we do in this life, because it's how we impact people that will last for eternity. That's the only fruit, church. Everything else in this life will fade, but people will last forever. Somewhere. And I know I've had people come and say, Pastor, what kind of fruit are you talking about? Are you talking about gentleness or patience or, or kindness or long? I mean, what kind of fruit is God asking us for? I think it's very clear because he says the fruit that I want is fruit that lasts. And the only fruit that lasts are people. Everything else will cease. Everything else is temporary. The only fruit in our lives that will last is the impact that we make on people. Every single human being has an eternal destiny, church. We will all last forever somewhere. This is why we need to make it our job as a church to reach out to as many people as we possibly can with the gospel, to hear and to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. We are running out of room as a church. It would be very easy to say, let's just a moratorium. You know what, folks? Don't bring anybody next Sunday. 55 people in Sunday school right now or last Sunday down. 55 kids. 55 children. We have, when I went up during the last song, I think we have three parking spots left in the entire facility. We have no room in the cafe. We have a church that is, God is bringing all kinds of fruit. So what kind of church are we going to be? Are we going to say that's enough? Or are we going to say every person needs to hear the gospel? We will open our, whatever we have to do for people to come and receive the good news of Jesus Christ. We clap. But when we go to two services, I want you to still clap. I want you to serve one, sit one. I want you to say, yes, we're doing this. Not because we want to be the biggest church in the world. No, that's not our, we just want to produce fruit. And God, if you keep bringing fruit, we're all in. I want to see front row filled with new people giving their lives to Jesus Christ. A lot of people wonder what kind of fruit. We need gentleness. We need kindness. Right? We need all those nice things. 
But you know the only eternal thing is people. Dawson Trotman, the founder of the Navigator, has said it this way. He said, the primary fruit of the Christian is another Christian. <laughs> that's, if, that's really what it is. This is the fruit that God has for every believer. This is why our mission as a church is to love Jesus and to love people and then empower you to go and do likewise. And that second part is just as important as the first part because unless we're reproducing, right, unless we're doing that second part, this is what Christianity is all about. Go and do likewise. Go and do what I've shown you. Help lead others to follow Christ like someone has shown you, someone has invested in your life, has sat with you, has counseled you, has done Bible studies. You've come. People have invested in your life, and now it is our job as the church to go and produce fruit that will last. And all of it has to be done for it to be effective with love. You don't need a degree for that. Every interaction we have with people will either push them towards Jesus or away from Jesus. We are all missionaries right here, church. We've all been appointed to go and to bear fruit, but only that which is done with love will last. And I'm going to prove that to you with the last three minutes of my message. Jesus lived what I just preached. He was appointed by the Father to go and produce fruit. And man, did he ever. Aren't you glad that Jesus went to a cross? We are all the fruit of that church. We're all the fruit of the Son responding to the Father's appointment. And can I just be honest? Sometimes the appointment to bear fruit, you've got to die a little too. That's why a lot of Christians don't want, they say they do, but they don't follow. He laid down his life for us. He showed us what love looks like. Is there anyone ever that has led a more significant life than Jesus? Bezo. Can't even think of anybody else. That's how much I care. Like Joe Biden there for a minute. <laughs> Whoever it is. Right? I just get that in for all of the political... You guys, I just throw it out there because it makes you happy. Here you go. Here's some candy. Here's some candy. Is there anybody that has ever lived a more significant life than Jesus? You know how he did it? You want impact? Die. Die for people. Lay your life down. The significance of your life. You, might, you may never stand up here. I was talking to someone recently who had been out of church for about probably four or five weeks, and I'd, I'd reached out, and, and they, I, I don't know how it came up, but they said, you know, um, Richie just reached out to me. And I, I just, I, I don't know what it was. It was like a proud father. I just said, wow, Richie's never going to be on this stage. He's, he's never up here preaching a message. But when someone wasn't in church, he reached out and loved. How are you doing? The guy was only sick, but what an impact. What an impact. His life is making eternal impact. And there's more. There's more people. Your life makes a difference because you do everything with love. You reach out. You respond. It wasn't, where were you, brother? It was, are you Okay. Is everything okay? What's going on? What a difference it makes. 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. This didn't come to me. Sometimes God will give you a message, 
and then the day before you're preaching, he brings everything together. We love this chapter. It's all about love is patient, love is kind, all, all the fruit we want. And it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, listen to this, love never ends. I go, wow. Wow. Fruit that will last. Love never ends. He says, as far as prophecies, they will pass away. Speaking in tongues, that'll pass away. All your good deeds, that'll all pass away. But the only thing that will last for eternity is our love for one another. What a word to the church today. What a word that could upend your life if you will say, God, I will love. I don't need a degree. I don't need a position. Pastor doesn't have to anoint me or appoint me, but I can go into the cafe today and I can love. I can call someone this week. I can open the Bible before church with somebody. I can love. We all can do love, church. There's no one here that can't love. And that's how we make impact that will last for eternity. God help us not to waste our lives with what this world says will last. Help us not to chase something that will never give us what we need. Let us choose significance. Do you want success or significance? What do you want? It's your choice. C.T. Studd said it this way, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. As we close, there are literally hundreds of ways that we can do this, that we can love one another. Every single week, we can go out these four walls, we can go and love. There are hundreds of ways that we can love. We can draw people. You know, you know why your friends and family are here with you serving God in the church here? They're because they see something, they see love in your life. There are hundreds of ways that we can do that. But I'm going to give you one simple way. And that is you can, this week, invite somebody to our next series starting this Sunday. It's called Resurrection Power. We're going to do four weeks going into Easter. And I'm doing this series. I was at the revival uh, there at Summit International School of Ministry, and I'm in the back, and God just, he just said, I want you to preach revival. And I said, well, I, I don't get any invitations to preach anywhere else. He goes, well, preach it at your church then. We're going to have four revival meetings here, and we're going to talk about resurrection power. And this is the reason why. This is what God told me. Because Easter needs to be more than just a nice story of what Jesus can do needs to be more than that. We need to know what Jesus can do in our lives. We need to enjoy resurrection power. And so there are people, listen to me, at the market, at, at your school, at your job, everywhere, friends, family, there are people in our world that need hope and they need you to tell them, come to church next week. And by doing that, listen here, we all can have eternal impact. How many want eternal impact with the gospel? There's no greater way. Just open our mouth and say, hey, I, 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 I just want to invite you. We've got this new series, and, and it's going to be awesome. I mean, make it up. Just tell them, you know, the pastor's good looking. Whatever you got to do. Why did I say that? Just say, I mean, it's just incredible. You got to come. Imagine in four weeks what we could all do if we chose, I'm going to live a life of eternal impact. My mouth, this is too good to keep to myself. But God is not, how many believe it's too good what God's doing here to keep to ourselves? We all, we all, listen, if we have to, we'll have all the teenagers stand in the back. It doesn't matter. I mean, I think we got 120 parking spots. we got three left. We're going to figure it out. I want you to bring as many people as you possibly can from now till Easter. Why? Not because of us. We want people to go to heaven. We want people to hear the good news of Jesus and respond. Every head bowed today. Every eye closed. Could be at the military base. Maybe you're in the Navy or Marine. we got, we got everything here. Army, whatever it is. Just open our mouth. That's, that's the only thing that I really, God just said, tell them something they can do.
going to preach this message, and then they're going to go, oh, that was great, wonderful, walk out. No, tell them something that we all can do this week. I want you to right now, by the Holy Spirit, just to bow your, your heads, your hearts, and just ask the Holy Spirit, who are you directing me to bring to church? Who is it? Is it a friend, a family make, uh, member, maybe a co-worker? Whatever it is. God, how can I be fruitful? How can I have eternal impact? That's what it's all about, church. We're going to Nepal in about four or five weeks, and I, I literally can't wait. You know why? Not because well, we're, the, we're, the mission, we're, we're a mission church. We do mission now. Because there's lives that are going to be there in Nepal that are going to receive Jesus Christ. We're going to go make eternal impact the gospel. It's not about us. It's not about the 20 people that are going. Look at us. No, it's about having lasting fruit. And the only kind that we have, the only kind of fruit that will last are people. And that's awesome. We're going. We can't wait. But imagine from now till we go, we all just said, yep, I'm all in. I want to make impact. Maybe it's a phone call like Richie. No one, I didn't ask him to do it. Nobody told him. He cares about people. He loves people. Can I just tell you this? There's nothing better in this life than being part of seeing lives change for eternity. <laughs> I've done a lot of things. I, I always tell my family, they kind of, they're like, you're a wacko. I'm like, I could go now. I've done a lot of things, seen a lot of things, but there's nothing in my life that could ever measure up than to see lives transformed by the power of gospel. There's nothing. I don't care how much money I could make, what kind of help. It doesn't. None of that. None of it. It all pales in comparison to listening to lives changed by the power of God. We all can be part of that. We can do it because we're going to bring somebody next week. We can do it because we're going to sign up to serve. We're going to help. We're going to go on an outreach on Saturday. We're going to call someone for, we can all do this because God has fruit for everybody. So the invitation is very simple today. Will you invite one person to church next week who can literally change their eternal destiny? Think about that. about that impact. You can, by inviting them to church, they hear the good news, they respond to the gospel. And literally, you're changing someone's eternity from hell to heaven. All because you chose to do something bigger than yourself. You're here today, you've been invited. I want to just acknowledge that we don't know everybody here. Might, might be your first time somebody's invited you. I know there's Many first-time visitors. You could be coming from a different church. We don't know all the backgrounds. But I do know one thing, and that is that God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we want to not offer you something as a church. We want to offer you the something, Jesus Christ that he can be your Lord and Savior. You need to admit that you're a sinner, that you're lost, that you can't fix yourself. You need to believe that God raised Christ from the dead. And you need to confess him as your Lord and Savior. If that's you today, you don't know Jesus. He loves you. He's appointed you to go and bear fruit. Would you just respond and say, you know what, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. I don't know him. I know religion. I've been raised in church. I know all the nuances of how to stand, where to stand, all the things that religion does. But I don't know Jesus. I'm not walking with him today. Would you raise your hand? Don't be embarrassed. Just raise it up quickly, front to back, side to side. See that hand in the back. Anybody else? I see that hand. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. You know what? I want to give my life to Jesus. 
Okay, here's the final part. The final part is all of us getting up out of our chairs and responding collectively as a church and saying, I want proof at last. And I'm willing, I'm willing to do what it takes to get that. <laughs> right? And for Jesus, it was dying on a cross. And I want to tell you, if you want to produce fruit, there has to be a death. There had, there's no other way around it, church. I wish I could say you want to produce fruit, just smile, be happy. No, 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 no. It requires death. You literally laying down your life for the benefit of others. We can all do that. And I really sense that God wants to solidify these five messages in this altar call today. That we respond as a church and say, we want fruit that lasts. Would you just slip out of your chair quickly? Come on up. We're all going to pray together. You can stand or kneel down here. We're going to pray. We're going to say, God, we need fruit. But we don't just need fruit that's temporary. I want fruit that lasts. Whether you're first time here,